Hello everyone, Dr. Christine Smith here. So I have a super cool guest for you today. This is Dr. Jared Alamong, who is one of my good friends and <laughs> teachers, and is a specialist in something called functional methylation. And I wanted people to have a chance to ask about this because I think methylation is talked about a lot, but he's one of the only people I've met who explains it in like a really tangible, understandable way. So if you guys have questions as we're going, you can ask them, but Methylation in a sense, and I'm going to let him talk about this mostly, but methylation is so much more than just like the MTHFR gene and B vitamins and stuff like that. Like it has to do with neurotransmitters and detox in your body. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Dr. Alamon, I would love if you could tell me a little bit about your practice and like what got you into functional methylation and how you think about methylation. Yeah, so I run, a, I run the Functional Health Center in Longmont, Colorado, and so and I've been practicing 15 years here, and uh, it's been a really, it's been a really fun journey through that process. But uh, I started doing a lot of functional medicine and a lot of digestive health, right? Like many of us practitioners, we spent a lot of time working in that field, and I, I got really interested in these cases that I would have, where it's like obviously this person's biochemistry is just not working in appro appropriately, right? Mm -hmm. And some of us, we have, you know, we think about great genetics. Everything kind of works well. And then you have people that just everybody in their family struggles. You know, you have that pervasive gluten sensitivity that runs through an entire family. Yep. Or everybody has a thyroid condition. Or everybody has anxiety. You know, you'll see that tendency often. And, and so when I started doing that, it started coming up in the road that this could be um, this could be genetic. This could be something that we're planned for and laid out with within our biochemistry, right? We got to live within the genes we're given to a degree. And so, and in Funk Med, we think all about epigenetics. Yeah. We think about how lifestyle affects it and what you eat is consuming and how you think is all part. And they are extremely important factors, right? I am not at all downplaying those. <laughs> yep. But at the same time, we also have to look with what we're given. And so we love the idea of root causes. Right? Yep. And, and, I, and I saw a question that said like, what is functional medicine, right? And this is why I love doing these things live because then you guys get to ask questions and I get to find out where you're at with stuff and like what I need to explain to you because sometimes practitioners will think that people know things, but they don't. So in a really fundamental term, like functional medicine is a systemic way of approaching health where there's not necessarily like one cause for everything. It's usually an accumulation of different lifestyle factors and different pressures on the body that lead to different conditions. And so that's another way of saying exactly what he was talking about is like we're born with a genetic blueprint that outlines tendencies of our bodies, but it's ultimately our lifestyle that really affects how those tendencies are expressed. And so that's like a, a general definition of what functional medicine is. And so, and then, yeah, he was saying it runs in families too, and then they also eat the same food. And so, yes, you yeah. have the genetic component of family and you have the nurture lifestyle pattern component of family. So Dr. Yeah. Jared treats a lot of families. Yeah, I do. I see a lot of whole families. And, you know, if you look at me and you look at a side-by-side -side picture of my dad, we look exactly like each other, right? <laughs> like <laughs> it's <do>. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> and that's for reason, right? It's our genetics that make up that. And we can identify that you are re directly related to this person because of those genetics. And so genetics do play an enormous piece in why things work the way they work and why our body frame is going to be the way it is, right? Many times um, insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity and blood sugar imbalances can very much be related to um, our genetic predispositions in this way. And so, yes, how much we could consume, um, like things like sugar will have affect this, but I have, a, I have a family of very high fast chemistry. Like I could eat, I'd be sick, very sick all the time if I ate sugar all the time, but I would still probably weigh about the same as I do. And that is just only based on the fact that that's the way my family runs. And so if you're a type of person that has that slow genetic chemistry and insulin resistance, you're always beating yourself up because you think you should be doing something different compared to that person that you see beside you. But it's not, it's not that you did anything wrong. It's that 
it, there is a difference of your chemistry. And then part of it is you have to work within that. But that is true. And it, you know, it's something that we like to say it's all environment. But I'm going to pull back and say, yes, it's partially environment, but it's also partially what you're, you're built with. And this is why health is so different for so many people and why you need to do customized treatment plans. And I saw a question that said, like, what's the best type of doctor to treat someone holistically? Or who, where should we look to consult a funk med doctor? So there's like a couple different resources. There are practices like Dr. Alamong's. And if you look for practices as like functional in the name where they say they do functional medicine, that's probably a good place to start. But there's different approaches to functional medicine too. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here and that I learned from Dr. Alamong is because he has a very clinically applicable way of doing biochemistry in the office, which I find is a lot more accessible for some people. And then there's, you know, functional medicine doctors that run a ton of lab testing. We also do lab testing here because we love having objective measures and it's really important, but it's like there's just different approaches to things and the way that we like to approach things is it's really foundational. So like really looking at where is the inflammation coming from. So a lot of the diagnoses out there um, to me, at the same time, I'm still looking for like where they came from, and it's usually an inflammatory cause. And so that's usually what we're tracking down is like what was the original cause of things. And I'm just, I'm gonna try to get some of the questions so we can address this in our conversation. So does too much B vitamin damage nerves, you know, run across salicylic sensitivity with patients? Um, it, why isn't homocysteine tested on everyone? That's a great question, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, um, that yes, and then, you know, uh, so yeah, let's let's jump into that, and we I'll just start it off with the question of, what is methylation? Yeah, let's just start there. Let's start there. So, so you know, methylation is a chemical reaction that happens in our body like a billion times a day. It's one of the most common biochemical reactions. It requires a main methyl donor, which is um, called Sam E, and so B vitamins like B twelve, B six, folic acid, and folate, right? Folate, the active form of folic acid. Um, is are the main donors to make SAMe, which is our main methyl donor throughout our whole chemistry. Yep. And um, methylation activates and converts and makes chemical changes and enzyme, enzymatic changes all throughout your biochemistry. And this has humongous implications relationship to um, especially neurotransmitters. Um, we think about one of the most common ones that we think about is the conversion of serotonin, right? Serotonin is our considered a happy neurotransmitter. Wellness, yes. Yeah, a neurotransmitter. To, it actually gets converted into melatonin, which is our sleep inducer, mm -hmm. right? And so... And immune functions. Yeah, and immune function and brain. They're using it all the time for brain inflammation now. And so melatonin, it, that conversion between serotonin and melatonin is just a methyl conversion. And so and melatonin is methylated serotonin basically. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to like rephrase it in a slightly different way. So when we're talking about methylation and methyl donors and this group moving around, it's basically a carbon and three hydrogens that's being moved between molecules to make new molecules. So this is in another term of what he's saying, like basically how your body builds different molecules in pieces, which is why if you don't have a methyl donor, you can't build the new molecules. So then you really struggle building certain neurotransmitters or detox or, and then homocysteine, because that question came up, basically is a byproduct of amino acid processing in your body, which is just like protein processing. And it's supposed to be recycled using a methylation process. But if we don't have methyl donors, then it can't get recycled. And then it's just these little inflammatory particles floating around in your blood vessels causing irritation. And that's how it can increase our inflammation levels. So I actually consider, we consider homocysteine a much more relevant marker for cardiovascular health than cholesterol. Cholesterol is more of like a secondary marker, but homocysteine tells me like, well, are like, what are the levels of inflammation? How are you actually detoxing your body properly? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So homocysteine is a fantastic marker. I run it literally on every test, the blood test, especially for a new person in my office. And because it's so practical to understand if the chemical reaction is happening correctly, if you're actually running methylation correctly. Yep. And so, you know, a lot of people will have enough B12 in their system on a blood work test or they might even have high B12, let's say, mm -hmm. but they actually have very elevated homocysteine at the same time. And in theory, those things shouldn't happen. 
right? So if you have high folate and high B12, you should clearly have lower homocysteine. But that's not actually what you see in clinical practice. What you see in clinical practice is people have high B12 and high folate, but they have very high homocysteine at the same time. Yeah. And it's that even though they have enough of those, whether they're actually working inside the cell to make the homocysteine conversions happen is another is a whole another ball game. And so um, that's why, you know, red blood cell nutrient levels have actually been more of a gold standard for sufficiency rather than just um, serum levels, which are blood levels. Yep, and this goes into like a lot of the testing that we do as functional medicine docs, right? It's like, yes, we totally run blood tests, but when I'm testing hormones, I also really like to look at saliva because that tells me like how your hormones are actually functioning within your cell. And then like we'll use urine tests to tell us how your body is breaking things down and like what you're excreting too much or too little of, that kind of thing. And I saw a question about like, is homocysteine hereditary? In a sense, kind of. That goes back to exactly what I was talking about in the beginning. So why don't you yeah. talk a little bit about how you incorporate your genetics with your clinical suggestions? Yeah, so um, functional methylation is actually a technique that I teach. I, yeah. I created it uh, a few years back, and I teach, you yeah, know, this is my chart on the wall related this to it. This is the biochemistry <laughs> that we're talking about. And so, yeah, I'm actually... Um, I'm gonna be in Sacramento this next weekend teaching a seminar to other doctors on how to use this in clinical practice. Yeah, so any practitioners watching this, um, highly recommend that you check out the seminar. It's really well priced and it's so much good information. And like, there's a reason I study with him and it's because I haven't found anybody that explains this in, in ex such an accessible way. So um, I, I run into other practitioners all the time and in Institute for Functional Medicine and stuff saying, oh, I wish I understood these components better or like lab testing better. And he's gonna talk a ton about that. So please continue. Yeah, so, um, you know, when you, when you think about this, um, I love to combine two things. And one of the things I'm passionate about is um, biofeedback and biofeedback testing. And so in my office, I do a lot of kinesiology. And for many of you that are familiar with that, that is, you know, known colloquially as, as muscle testing. But it's basically a nervous system response test of, of your body telling, telling you if it's getting stressed by something. And so that could be like someone, you know, yelling at you. When you when you have someone yelling at you, your body feels an actual stress response. Well, your body can actually pick up stress responses. Just I always say, you wouldn't want to hold uranium in your hand, right? That that it, it, it emits radioactive particles, yes. right? Even though you're not seeing the the radioactive particles, they're affecting your system. And the same thing when you do um, kinesiology with a, a kid like mine is that you're having all these very specific homeopathics done of different chemistry, and your body gets to resonant whether it's okay with that or not okay with that. And that's a form of biofeedback or bioexpression. And when you pair that together with actually looking at genetic data, you can actually get a good idea of what's expressing along with what you're predisposed to. Yeah. Then you can take a step further and actually run lab testing to validate that, like an organic acid profile is a, no, a known profile that you can run to actually look at, okay, what are these metabolites looking at in your urine that could, um, that could indicate if this is actually presenting. Yep. So there's a couple ways to get, that, get the, the feedback of like what actually pertains to you specifically and how does that relate to. One of the biggest things I teach on is how symptoms correspond to pathways. And it, when you can, you can actually have a, just a conversation with someone and know a ton about what's likely going on with their genetics and then you can confirm in a couple different ways. Yep. And it helps guide, guide better decisions as practitioners. Well, and you know, a lot of people will say like, oh, well, you know, that's more of a subjective technique. And it's like, well, yeah, sure. Well, that's why we correlate with lab testing, but it's just, it's one more technique for things to go together because I find when you're trying to really take a deep look at somebody's health, having a variety of angles and perspectives to look at it from is usually the best way to go. And it's gonna get you the clearest answer. So one of the ways that we'll use the muscle testing in the office is, you know, he, he spent a lot of time and decades of research like <laughs> developing this kit to look at specific enzymes in the body and how they're functioning and genes. And so it's like, we can go through with these items that have been imprinted with the uh, energetic resonance of these enzymes and see if your body emits a stress response when it's interacting with that and it gives us an inkling of like oh I think this might be off let's run this specific lab test and most of the time they correlate and I did a whole other talk on muscle testing that you guys can check out if you're more curious about that but yeah go for it yeah it's it's a really interesting 
idea that as practitioners, you know, you follow what you study, most of us, mm -hmm. right? If you look at someone that studies gut health, then they talk about gut health all the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, uh, what's, what's really unique and what I find fascinating is I've studied so much neurology, I've studied so much, um, you know, genetic stuff, I've studied so much gut health related stuff, and what I love about kinesiology is it gets it out of my hands and my head and gets it back to that person's body asking them what they have going on. And you're like, oh, I have my, I'm on my own like genetic train of what I'm testing with them. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is all gut. <laughs> and yes. so all we're going to yes. do is work on your gut because that's what's priority. And so it's really nice to make, create a system where your that, that person, that, clini that, that client's body is taking priority over my um, biases, really. <laughs> yes, I couldn't agree more. And it's like, it's so nice in practice to be able to literally, when someone comes into your office, be able to say, oh, is your body responding to this supplement in the way that I anticipated that it would? Or are we pushing your body too hard? Which is like something that happened to my body, right? Like I just, it got pushed a little bit too fast. And so now I've had to work on like really, really getting specific with the timing and the amount of my supplementation to serve my body the best because of my genetics and like how my body processes molecules. And that's like the foundational component of all of this. And so it's, it's a really cool approach to things. But um, I had seen some other questions pop up just around like sensitivities and how those things develop and like how is methylation involved. And, um, and then other questions about like prebiotics and stuff. So I will say like, I can't give you, I'm not, I'm literally not allowed to give you guys specific recommendations online um, because I have to tell you to consult with your healthcare provider and take a proper history. And that's just how this works. But I can talk about theory and I can teach you about physiology and I can teach you about things that you can ask questions about or look up. So that's kind of how we approach things on here. So just know if I don't answer a specific question, like that's why. Um, but then when it comes back to, you know, how methylation acts in the body and how it affects different sensitivities, let's like, let's, maybe pick like a clinical example of like how someone's health could kind of cascade based on maybe a slight difference in their genetics. So, you know, if someone with like, um, we, so when we're talking about these genetic differences, they're called SNPs, SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. It's like a slight difference in your DNA. And so some people will have like a SNP, like the MTHFR SNP, that's a commonly known one, or mm -hmm. COMT is another one that you might know. Mm -hmm. um, and basically when you have these, it changes how your body processes neurotransmitters or processes different molecules. And then if you have like a super stressful event in your life, based on these genetics, you might not process it as well as somebody else and you might need different kinds of support, so. Yeah, I'll give a good clinic, like a, an example that you'll actually see in practice cool. is, um, and I'll use COMT as the common one. So COMT is the methylation enzyme. So it's a methyl dependent enzyme that, uh, that clears dopamine, serotonin, I mean, sorry, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. And so, but it's actually a major detoxification chemical too. Mm -hmm. So it's involved in estrogen clearance primarily. And mm -hmm. so to actually clear estrogen down the kind of anti-carcinogenic pathway, mm -hmm. it actually uses COMT. That's the correct way to metabolize estrogen. And so if you have a SNP, a major SNP in a, a couple locations on COMT, then that can actually very much slow the way that enzyme works. Well, if you naturally run that enzyme slowly and then, you, then you're in a situation in your life where you're really stressed out, then that enzyme's being really forced to work on clearing epinephrine and clearing norepinephrine. Yep. And because of that, it will not have the, uh, that enough resources to actually clean up estrogen metabolism. Well, what happens if you're a female and you get put on birth control while that's happening? And that's a, that's a very common story is, is because we know stress hormones in itself affects estrogen production and how healthy a menstrual cycle will be. And so if the, you know, a lot of times people are putting on estrogen to regulate their menstrual cycle, and that also co tends to correspond to stress. Well, if you have a COMT variant, you're gonna now have way too much estrogen going on in your system. In addition to that, you're still not processing those, um, that dopamine and that norepinephrine, epinephrine correctly. So this is a story that you'll see very commonly and just having that type of knowledge to know that this is you 
helps you know that, man, you need to actually probably think about relaxation exercises, right? That's me. <laughs> you need to think about things that are going to calm that pathway down, but you can also actually help make COMT run faster. And, and sometimes that makes a big difference. And where functional medicine really thrives is in the idea of knowing, hey, this is where your chemistry is struggling, and this is the type of nutrition or the type of lifestyle change or the type of supplementation that could improve that. And one thing that I always, I have, you know, I have lots of patients at this point, uh, you know, in years of practice. And, and one thing I say is, is when I, when I formulate stuff for them, I oftentimes think about the biochemistry really in depth. So many people, they don't stop taking some of the, the support that they take because they know that pretty quickly it starts to go backwards. It, it doesn't work as well because sometimes when it's directly correlated to chemistry, like what we're talking about with the COMT, it's like lifelong. You know, yep. it's not, it's not going to be something that changes. This is who you are and this is who you were built with. Yep. And most likely this is also your parents <laughs> or one of them at least. Right. Yep. And so that's why you see those trends. And so let me like paint a, a clinic, like another picture for you of like what that can look like of everything that he was just talking about. Right. So let's say that you have this like SNP that makes your comp a little bit different than somebody else's. And that's, you know, this enzyme that processes your neurotransmitters and your estrogen. So now let's say that you like get in a fender bender and then you have to take care of that, but it's a little bit stressful. And then you're also like really busy at work, so you're a little bit stressed about that. And then let's say you like have some relationship disagreements with your family at home and that's stressful. And it's like all these little stresses start building up. Nothing's like horrendous, but they just start building up. And then all of a sudden you like start to feel a little bit more emotional and a little bit like, ugh, just kind of sluggish. And then you start eating foods and you start getting bloated and then you like wake up in the morning and you kind of have a headache and it's like this slow progression over a few months you're like man like i just oh ever since that little fender bender i have just like not felt the same and it's because when you get in something like that it triggers the stress response and then it changes the way the enzyme is working and then you can't clear your estrogen as well and then your hormones build up in your system and then you become a little bit more emotional and a little bit more anxious and th and that goes for men too right like i'm not talking about estrogen only in women this exists in men as well and so then you start getting more anxious about things and then that anxiety actually affects your gut health along with the fender bender as well and then your gut starts to get a little bit irritated from different foods that you're eating and then the holidays roll around and you eat a bunch of dairy and a bunch of gluten and a bunch of eggs and sugar which you can usually handle and you're drinking coffee and you're doing all the things and it's like oh you're, you're doing okay but oh it's just the holidays you're just a little stressed and then January rolls around you're like yeah okay I'm ready I'm ready for my new year's resolution but I have absolutely no motivation and I just don't care and I kind of feel like crap this is how people get stuck in this cycle is because they don't know the physiology of what's going on. So after you get in that fender bender, when we teach you these things, you can be like, oh, you know what? I should probably be really careful with my food for the next few months and probably add in a little bit more meditation. That might be helpful. Or go visit my functional medicine provider so that they can make a suggestion for where my body is at right now. And that's kind of the idea of functional medicine is like what's going on with you right now not like i'm gonna wait till you have a diagnosis to deal with whatever's going on it's like oh like your blood sugar got really high after that fender bender we should probably check on like your detox and your liver pathways and see how you're doing and then maybe we make a suggestion for a little while and then you don't need it anymore or it changes and that's why like seeing your practitioner and having a relationship on a regular basis can be really beneficial because you have this third party that knows you and knows your body and knows your tendencies and then when something happens in your life you have some support rather than just like only an annual checkup, which only looks for certain things. So that's just another way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a find, I find that a lot of people, um, I always talk to them, uh, you know, with my clients that, you know, my, got, my idea is, is to understand your chemistry, to understand your individuality, yep. what, what, what makes you work. And then they come back to me when everything, anything goes wrong and you know, they want my suggestion first because I know their chemistry more than anybody else does. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot, you know, when you, when you think about it, I, I, I said, I can hear listen to your story <laughs> and you know, that's the person that walks in your door and you're like, man, there's a lot to process. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's every practitioner, no matter who you go and see, it's a lot to process because people's individual health is complex. Yes. It's not just one factor. It's a lot of different factors. And one thing I love about functional methylation and this idea of chemistry is looking and seeing how chemistry interconnects. 
and how it can snowball like that very quickly. The more you, more that your practitioner specifically, or you as an individual, understands chemistry as a whole, um, biochemistry, then, then you actually understand where those things can link and how doing certain types of supports or doing certain types of changes in your lifestyle can make a huge impact as a whole. And this is where we can kind of like look through what turns up in your appointment, like what shows up as is irritating to your body and be like, oh, oh, your body is in this state. Well, actually, I can use this one supplement to hit like four different pathways. Yeah, that's the game. Yeah, it is. It, <laughs> that's that the is game. Exactly that's the game. How I can give you the least amount of yes. things with the lar largest amount of impact. And that's like, the hardest part of being a functional medicine doctor is knowing physiology and biochemistry well enough to be able to do that, which is why I studied with them. So it's just those kinds of things can really change somebody's life really quickly. And you know, like when I, when my body was having a hard time, he's like, okay, please take this one form of magnesium and nothing else. And we're just going to see what effect that has. Cause my body got to the point where it just like, it couldn't process a bunch of things. So more isn't always better. It's like, sometimes that you just need to be really specific with things. So, um, so then when we talk about like, teaching and like teaching other practitioners I think that's probably one of the most important things is like every so many people need help and I saw a question earlier of like where do we practice can we some come see you heck yeah absolutely we are in Longmont Colorado um, the clinic is functional health center Colorado you can go um, to that website yeah. Functional Health Colorado is our website. Yes, sorry, Functional Health Colorado. And, um, and Dr. Alamong is here, I'm here. He is uh, booked out a few months. I have a little bit more availability if you need to get in sooner, um, but we are available to you. So feel free to check that out and give us a call if you'd like. Um, and yes, I totally agree with that comment of like process well-being for everyone is similar and different. It's about the disease process that varies and yeah, ultimately it's like a lot of what we focus on is lifestyle medicine and just like teaching people how to listen to their bodies and to remember that like you're supposed to go get sunlight and you're not supposed to be inside all the time or like sleep is important. And it's just like, we all know this, but sometimes we need someone to remind us or be like, oh, like your body actually would do better if you fasted in the evening versus yeah. the morning based on your genetics and like what's showing up for you. And so giving little customized tips, which is why the same thing doesn't work for everybody. And so because there's so many people that need help, that is why he teaches other practitioners. So my next question for you is what, what motivated you to start teaching other practitioners? Mm. Well, um, you know, I was, I was offered opportunity to speak and, you know, I thought, well, if I'm going to start speaking on this topic, you know, I want to do it well. And so I decided to start formulating and formulating a, a, a way of testing and using questionnaires and trying to pull about what I actually do in my practice and into a way to teach other doctors how to replicate it. Um, I, get, I constantly get asked, where, who, who could I see that's like you in this area of the country? I'm like, I don't know, really know. <laughs> like, right, because we're, as, as practitioners, our knowledge is so specific to what the training we've, we've taken. So we're all like very different. Yes. And we all have a lot of value. Yes. It, it's just, we're all different. And, um, you know, just to replicate yourself, it's just not A plus B, C. It's just not that simple. No. And so, you know, I think one of my biggest messages through this process is to, to really help explain Ex explain individual expression and, and actually help people see that and help practitioners see that see that as well. I think so much of the time we get in this idea that these li these these lifestyle choices work for everyone. You know, if you just um, meditate, decrease your stress, don't eat these foods, right? Um, you know, get enough sleep, everything will work just perfectly. And and the truth of it is is yeah, that will help a lot of people. Depends on the state your body's in. And then there's a lot of people that are just like, I am doing everything right. And yep. they're just like killing themselves. And they're like, why am I not getting better? Yep. And I think that is so much of the message of people that really seek me out and actually do really well my practices, helping that person find harmony, find the answers of why, the, why am I doing everything right, but it's not working. Yep. And, um, you know, it takes some testing. It takes some looking at their genetics. It takes really putting these symptom profiles together along with understanding chemistry to, to take them step by step through a process of healing. And so, um, you know, for most, for most people, they can take these general recommendations and they can, they, they can really thrive on them, yep. right? 
there, there's so much value in that in, in working on it. And, in, and we call that epigenetics. We call that the idea of our lifestyle and our environment affecting the way that our genes express it with each other. Yes. Okay. The thing about some of the genetics are like COMPT is that enzyme has to run all the time whether what you're doing it, it just what you're doing is depending on how much of that resource is being utilized and where it's being utilized but it always has to be utilized so how it natively works is a big factor so they always say well it's it's like mind and body over the genetics right but that's for a person that naturally has that they're always going to run a little wired right <laughs> There's, there's people that are always going to run just kind of down. If you have all the serotonin snips in a row, then you're always gonna want, you're always gonna run low serotonin. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's always gonna affect your motivation. You're never gonna be able to get yourself quite up like, like that someone that's just like super happy and spunky all their lives, right? There's there, a lot of times that is, there, there are genetic factors that, that play into that personality development. Yeah. Just like their, your color of your hair, just like the color of your eyes, just like the, the body frame you have. Like so much of that is connected to our makeup yeah. and we don't understand it. And we've put so much, we put, we've, and there's a ton of research going in this area of, of functional genetics and SNPs. There's tons of research on it. So, you know, what's cool about it is I can get this idea in my head. I wonder what's going on with this. And I can actually look at a whole bunch of journal studies and read about what it, what's being done and what the science has shown around this. So yep. that's another part about functional medicine is this idea that, you know, it's really science driven. It's, it's usually science driven, whole body chemistry focused. It's physiology focused. Right. Yes. Which I love, right? Because it's like every diagnosis is technically a vocabulary word that describes a physiological process. And so it's like all of those just describe a physiological process that's going on in your body. So we just focus really hard on the physiology and how to balance it. And I saw a couple questions pop up. One of them was about um, like being in Australia and what tests and stuff. Um, send me a private message. I have a friend that works virtually with people in like New Zealand and Australia. Um, so it's like there's there's a variety of different ways to find practitioners. One of the really unique things about Dr. Alamong's approach and like why I love learning it is because you can actually test people in office which is a really hard thing to do for a lot of practitioners. So if you do have someone in person, you can uh, really get customized in the moment. But then there's a lot of other ways to do things online. We do work with people online as well because sometimes people can't physically be present and that's when we use a lot more lab testing and analyze the labs. And there's like a huge list I could go over. Um, basic one, like ba a basic way to say what we look at is like, We'll run hormone panels that look at how your cells are processing it, what exists in your blood, what you're excreting, where your detox pathways are struggling. We will look at gut panels, which is one of my favorites that I always look at, and like food sensitivities because, you know, it's, it's just a tool. Everyone's always asking me, what can I do at home? What can I do at home? What's free? Food is a free tool that you can use at home. So mm -hmm. what you put in your mouth can be medicine. As Hippocrates said, food is medicine. So basically, that's one of my favorite tools. We'll also look at neurotransmitters and like how your body is breaking those down. Sometimes we'll look at, have you been exposed to an environmental pathogen like mold or pesticides or toxins? Because mm -hmm. you can like be playing on a playground and have some truck drive by and spray a bunch of pesticides and then those will stay in your system for decades unless you do the right things to detox them properly. And it can really affect hormones and a lot of other things. And that's, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we encounter is the environmental toxins that exist in our environment. Even just like drinking from plastic water bottles it seems really like not that big of a deal but you're technically swallowing hormone mimickers and so it's like we're, our bodies our bodies are dealing with something that we call allostatic load which is like the overall mm -hmm. stress load from all the components um, and in chiropractic we talk about it really simply thoughts traumas toxins those are the things that affect your health and so what we're talking about is basically how to mitigate those in a realistic way while taking into account what you were given what you were born with and how your body generally functions but then how you can affect it with lifestyle factors. And if you need an extra little boost, and that's mm -hmm. when you come see a practitioner and we help you over the hump. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think one thing is, is you know, detox genes are, are oh, highly researched. Yeah. let's talk about those for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's protocols that you can run. You can run um, 
you can run a, a testing to actually look at your detoxification pathways to, to see if you have genetic predispositions. Some people have very unusual medi medication reactions, mm -hmm. and a lot of that data can be defined based on your genetics. We know that, oh, based on how this specific gene works, then you won't, you won't be able to metabolize acetaminophen correctly, or, and that can actually or really affect. Or containing <laughs> enzymes. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, some people, they detox pretty smoothly and easily. So their toxic burden is they get it out quickly, right? Yep. Which that, that person in today's society Lucky. operates well, right? <laughs> but all of us that, that have variants where their, their enzyme, at, their processes work more slowly on the de detoxification process, they kind of have to work at it, yep. right? And you have to take some of those allostatic load factors off so their body can re deviate resources into to creating clearance. Yep. Right, and then you have to get out in a couple of different ways, right? You have to do sauna to, to get it out, right? You, you need to get up enough water and, and it kind of help your kidneys work as best they can and you need to support the liver. And so sometimes when I go over actual a genetic report with, with clients, either in office or virtually, I'll do it. You know, I'll spend time talking about how efficient their body is set up to clear chemicals. Yeah. And I think that's advantageous to know, okay, you're the type of person that needs to, um, to really support this chemistry here and try to do all the things right, not to drink from plastic bottles, eat absolutely as much organic food as possible, right? Um, you know, not everybody can prioritize everything they should do. Right. Not every one of us have every resource, you know, available. Um, financial, time, all those resources. There's a million resources that we need. And usually, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of at our limit, just surviving life. And so, you know, <laughs> having to, prioritizing what resources you're gonna put energy into, you know, makes a, makes a big difference. And sometimes looking at a genetic helps bring to mind things that you shouldn't forget. Mm -hmm. Stuff you shouldn't ignore. Like, I really need to drink more water because my detox pathways are slower, which I have just found out about through life experience. But, you know, it's like, this is why I like teaching you guys physiology because I'm sure every single doctor has told you to drink more water. But the reason that we're saying to drink more water is because it detoxifies your body, it lubricates your neurons for function, it lubricates your organs, it pushes things through. It's like, it is the oil for your body and we, we have to have it. So it's like, those are the physio physiological reasons behind why we make these suggestions. Um, mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, I yeah. think those and are And when important. you put a substance in your body as much as you put water in your body, yep. that, you know, you want that water to be as clean as possible. <laughs> yes, I agree. And there, and that's why, like, I use a water filter and why I have an air filter in my apartment is because it's like, those are the things where you plug them in and then you never have to think about it again. And it's just like helping your health on a daily basis. So I love telling people just about, like, those easy fixes. And then I saw a question earlier about, well, you know, like, well, what's the diet to focus on? And like, this is why we do what we do and why we run lab testing is because I can't answer that perfectly for everyone. In a yeah. very general sense, the thing that I will tell people to focus on is most of your food should be organic vegetables. Organic matters because of the pesticide thing, because the way pesticides work to kill insects is they destroy their guts from the inside out. Why in the world we didn't think that would happen to us? I don't know. But... Yeah, that's why pesticides matter and why organic matters. So go for organic veggies and then lean, clean protein that's gonna be like wild caught, pasture raised, sorry, natural and cage free really don't mean much. Go for like pasture raised, grass fed, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, nuts and seeds. That's like the other thing I tell people, That's there's so many minerals and good things in there. Um, and then like fruit, I try low glycemic fruit as like a treat, right? Fruit, fruit's only supposed to be available evolutionarily like three months out of the year. We're not supposed to have access to it all the time. Yeah. So that's kind of like, the paleo approach, that's usually like a good approach, but some people are sensitive to eggs and some people are sensitive to tomatoes and some people are sensitive to salmon. And like, this is why we run the food sensitivity test because mm -hmm. someone's like, I'm doing keto and I'm eating all the salmon and I'm eating this stuff and I don't understand why I'm not feeling good. And then we figure out that they're basically sensitive and allergic to it. And it's like, oh, well that would be why. So this is why I can give you that general sense of what to focus on and that'll work for a lot of people, but for the people who are still struggling, this is why we do the testing that we do is we can figure out why you're still struggling. Yeah. yeah. A fun fact about, um, I just wanted to kind of yeah. go talk about like a relationship in genetics that's really interesting, is that in cardiovascular disease, one of the chemicals that, that prevents um, uh, oxidation of our vessels 
is an enzyme called PON1. It actually protects, it is an HDL molecule that protects oxidation of LDL. <laughs> and so that's the main driver of cardiovascular disease is the oxidized bad cholesterol, basically. And PON1 is, is a gene that commonly has SNPs on it. What's really interesting about PON1 is it's the only pathway that clears glyphosate. Mm. So when you... Which is Roundup, by Which the way. is Roundup. Yeah, Roundup. So the main pesticide that we put on all crops requires this enzyme to metabolize it. Mm. So when you have a bunch... Of, and if you have a gene SNP in this enzyme, it's going to slow... It's going to typically be slower in its ability to metabolize glyphosate. Well, then you're stealing that resource, that enzyme activity, to deal with glyphosate all the time. And its job is to protect your vessels from oxidation in your circulation system. So there's that direct link of how something like glyphosate in someone that has a PON1 variant can really escalate cardiovascular issues. And so, and that's just chemistry. It's kind of really cool that that's just biochemistry. And I didn't really know that biochemistry until I started studying it in depth. Studying genetics in depth was when I really came to that, like, oh, wow, that's really cool, you know? And that kind of leads back to that whole conversation we had about insulin. Yep. Oh yeah. So the like one of my original posts from a while back that got like a whole bunch of questions and stuff was a fact I actually learned from him, which was about insulin degrading enzyme and how if you have high levels of insulin in your body, it distracts your body's resources from being able to break down plaques in your brain. Now, a lot of people wanted to point out to me that like Alzheimer's is not caused by plaques. I'm aware of this. What I was yes, saying in that post is that they are basically a side effect of your body not being able to detoxify itself. And then Sorry, oh, yeah. we had an alert that <laughs> popped up on the phone. But basically your cleanup crew is distracted from being able to um, break down those plaques in your brain, which are not like, they're not functional, they're not good, they're not supposed to be there, but it's your body protecting itself basically with scar tissue and your neurons, but you're supposed to be able to clean it up, and then you can't if you're constantly in like a super high sugar state. And then that can also be affected by the genes related to that enzyme. And so mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what we were talking about in that last one. Yeah, so so um, just to go a little bit further yeah, into that idea it. there. So I was trying to figure out is the IDE gene, what research was there to validate if IDE, the enzyme, degradating enzyme, actually genetic SNPs in it affect um, your risk of Alzheimer's disease, if there's research on it. So I was reading research article and research article on this, and what I came across is a research article where they actually showed that in a light of high insulin levels, that will steal, that, that actually supersedes your ability to make that enzyme clear beta amyloid, which is its primary job to do at night. Yep. So uh, uh, through night, every night your brain's cleaning itself. That's yep. why we sleep, is <laughs> is so our brain can clean itself mm -hmm. primarily. And so um, one of the main clearance mechanisms is IDE cleaning beta amyloid mm -hmm. from the brain. And so when your insulin levels are high through the night, it actually supersedes. It's that enzyme preferentially works on insulin over beta amyloid. And this is why if you eat a bunch of food right before you go to bed, especially high carb food or sugar, your brain does not clean itself as well while you sleep. And if you do that every day of your life, then you might have a brain that doesn't function as well when you're, you know, not that old, like yeah. when you're just kind of middle aged. And so it's like, this is why the lifestyle stuff matters and why the genetics also play into it. But the lifestyle stuff is super, super important. And why someone might do like you're like well my friend does this like why can't i do that because you probably have some different genetics and you probably clear things differently so this is why understanding yourself in your own body and learning how to read it right which is like a, a lot of what i try to teach you guys on here is like how to notice when your body is off like if you wake up in the morning and you're five pounds heavier we don't gain weight like that that's water weight that's inflammation weight you just ate something in the last 48 hours that your body didn't like so you can kind of review what you ate and be like oh maybe maybe i shouldn't have had that much cream in my coffee maybe i should just like take a take a little break from it or something like that and when you can start to spot these things this is how you can start to manage your own health in a realistic sustainable way because if i just tell you to stop eating everything all the time like that's not gonna work so I just have to teach you how to be like oh well I've, I've reached my capacity 
for yeah. this thing for this week. I should take a break for the rest of the week <laughs> until next week. And then I can like check back in. Or sometimes you need to do it for longer. So yeah. it's like the threshold, the capacity. And your genetics basically create what your threshold is. Yeah. Sometimes you're just explaining chemistry to explain why the symptom you're experiencing is like changing. Yes. Right? If you're the person that has this problem with insulin, right, and you actually stop, like you stop eating earlier in the night, and you, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm sleeping deeper. And when you wake up in the morning, my brain's sharper. Oh, cool. I, I, like, woke, I woke up feeling rested for once instead of waking up tired. Right. And, and then on a sciencey level, we can think about it and say, oh, cool. Now you're cleaning your brain better. <laughs> like your insulin's lower. We know that your brain is actually healthier. That's not just a make-believe kind of, I think this is working for me. This is a realistic change that's actually greatly improving your health. Yes. And if you are, um, you know, if you are an example, right, if you're an APOE carrier for, and, and APOE is such an important gene because it activates all kinds of inflammatory cascades. Yes. In both cardiovascular disease, but specifically in Alzheimer's disease. And, and so if you're doing things that can actually help Re, like change that inflammatory cascade and change that predisposition you already have, they become really important. And so um, that's where those two worlds come together. Of like, why is it nice to know that if you're an APOE carrier is because it just tells you, oh, my brain wants to get more inflamed than the average person. So therefore I should be more careful with my food and it would be great if I meditated more yeah. and exercised more. Yeah, because we all want to like, be able to think straight when we're older. Yes, exactly. And like, you know, and I always, I work on people, I work with people on their goals a lot, right? And it's like, you can have the goal of like, oh, I want to look good in my swimsuit in the spring. And like, you know, that's a fine goal. Um, it's probably not going to motivate you for that long and you're probably going to slip off the train. If you motivate yourself with like, you know, I woke up really puffy this morning. I'm kind of irritable. I'm kind of bloated. I did this last week too. I really don't feel like having dementia when I'm older and I'm developing a pattern. I should probably like take a look at this pattern. That's going to be a much bigger motivator to like be around to have kids or meet your grandkids or be able to be in your older years and like actually physically be at Christmas dinner instead of like not being able to be there because you're too sick and you're just like living in a bed, right? That's tough. And so those are like my motivators is like, I want to be a vital active participant in my life until the very end. So that's really how I motivate myself with this stuff. And that's where I talk to people about their own motivation. And it's really based on you. And then there's a question earlier about like how, who can we see for holistic care? So this is also one of the other reasons I study with Dr. Alamon, because we also do um, what's called neuroemotional technique. And it's like the muscle testing that we were talking about. We can actually use that to dive into like what subconscious thoughts are actually causing you stress. And we can do it in a, you know, a way that's um, pretty quick. And we also work with a therapist in the office. So when people have things that are deeper that they need to work on, then we refer them over to her and we work as a team collaboratively because I think that's what healthcare should be. I don't, I don't know why there's this like argument between degrees and stuff. Like really you should just be asking your practitioner what they do for their continuing education, not what their degree is because their continuing edu education will tell you a lot more about what they actually do. Um, but then we can clear these emotional stresses for people that are contributing to affecting their gut lining and affecting their cardiac health and affecting your blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not separate. Um, and you kind of have to address all of the things, the thoughts, traumas, toxins. So that's what we mm -hmm. talked about. Traumas being physical stuff. That's why we do chiropractic adjustments is because people need body work. They just do. I mean, yeah, you can go your whole life with your hips being crooked and you'll probably function mm -hmm. fine for 20 years, but then 30 years, you're going to wonder why you have arthritis and it's because you've been walking crooked for 20 years. And so that's why we do physical work. And then the toxins is like everything we're talking about with the environmental stuff and the nutrition and the gen genetics. And then the thoughts is what I just mentioned. So yeah. That's, that's more like the holistic approach. You know, back 15 years ago when I created my practice, you know, when you, when you uh, for all of you that, that, you know, aren't practitioners and just, just um, you just come out of practice, you don't, you have so much freedom to do what you want to do. There's no specific, you know, formula of like, do this, do this, do this. Yep. And what I, what my goal was is I wanted to create a type of like environment of healthcare that really addressed those factors, right? Trauma, toxins, and thoughts. And gave people the experience I wanted to have. Like if I was a patient, this is the type of experience I would wanna have. 
And I actually still, I think 15 years later, I still approach every day, every way that, that way. And I've just kind of brought people into my practice and made it in a way that it is collaborative and it is kind of like, oh, you know, you want to look at the thought side. This is a very effective way to get there, right? If we're going to look at it, if we're going to address the biochemistry side, this is what kind of blood work you need to run to do this. Yeah. You know, the physical body, this is how we can access. Is this problem that you as a person experiencing, is it coming from your structure? Is it from your, coming from your biochemistry? Is it coming from your genetics? Is it coming from your lifestyle, right? Is it coming from your thoughts? And that's the question that we all have. And when you really can hit the heart of that for someone, it is life-changing for them. Yep. I completely agree. So I just saw a quick, let's use this as a clinical example as we kind of start mm -hmm. to wrap things up. So I saw a comment above of like, well, is arthritis just due to posture then? Well, let's talk about the holistic approach to arthritis and everything that you would check in a client with arthritis. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the first thing you need to do and is- how brain health might be affected based on the pathways that are going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, arthritis is is a very inflammatory symptom, right? There's, there's like mechanical too, um, people that, uh, running, wear and tear. Uh, you know, yeah. overweight and obese, or they they were an athlete, right? There's wear and tear on the joints that are very real, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole part of arthritis is trauma induced, right? You had a car accident that you have arthritis as a result of a, a car accident or an injury specifically. And then there's arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis that's inflammatory arthritis, and osteoarthritis is a huge, a huge part of osteoarthritis is inflammatory. And so, you know, one of the most important things to do is to run blood chemistry to actually look at your inflammatory cascade. Now, these blood tests are not the standard blood test, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I almost never have a, a patient come into my office that's had actually an inflammatory set, like, assessment done with their primary care every year. That is not that's, what we do. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so, but priority number one is to actually look at that and see, okay, well, is your inflammatory systems up? Right. Yep. And that's why so many people will put them on like a little bit of a customized food cleanse and then in like three or four weeks they're like, you know, my joint pain went away. Yeah. Or I find, and you guys can notice this, right? We have the holidays coming up. We just had our sugar holiday. Now we're about to have our pie and a holiday. Then we're about to have our cookie holiday. Then we're going to have our alcohol holiday. And people wonder why we get sick this time of year. Like, let's just throw that out there. Um, but anyway, we have the holidays. It's holiday. a good synopsis of that time. <laughs> no, right? frame. So we have our holidays coming up. I want you to notice after you indulge and you do all the sweets and you do all the stuff, I want you to notice how your joints feel and how your brain feels and how your guts feel. And I bet you anything that you're, you might have a little bit more arthritis. And no, it's not just the winter, unless you're mm -hmm. like eating perfectly through winter. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes it can really be tied to all the things that we're talking about, because none of this is separate. None of our body systems are separate. Like if your joints are inflamed, your brain is probably also kind of inflamed because the inflammation is systemic. It's a, it's a systemic response. So if one organ is inflamed, the other ones are gonna be inflamed, which is why like if you get super stressed out and your gut is kind of inflamed, and then you know, you're using the building block tyrosine to basically build all of your stress pathways so that your body can function in this state, then you're actually stealing the building block from your dopamine and your neurotransmitters, and you're also stealing from your thyroid hormone. And then suddenly when you're really stressed out, you start to feel really tired and you don't have energy in the right way it's because they're all affecting each other. So this is what we're talking about. None of it's separate. No, no, not at all. And the trick is, is what, what, are, what do you need to do tomorrow? You know, what do you, what do you need to do now that's gonna make the biggest difference? And working with a practitioner opposed to doing it on your own is having the support of someone else to yeah. kind of help look at it with you and ask the right questions and run the testing that's gonna make the biggest difference. And people, I mean, I, I would say one of the most common things that I, I have is people feel relieved. They feel relieved to have be heard and they, they're they relieved to have someone that really ex expresses like competency at what they're doing, right? Yes. <laughs> and this is why I study. And he still studies. He's 15 years in practice and he's studying all the time. Yeah. And so it's like, it's it's a never ending journey. Like we're, this is kind of a lifelong profession that we choose where it's like school, like our degrees, the four super intense years of doctor school, they're like this little structural framework that basically teaches you the fundamentals of physiology and like 
some general knowledge about your treatment approach. You're supposed to spend the next few decades filling in that framework with the knowledge of where you want to specialize and like understanding how to work with patients. And that's why they call it a practice. Like you're constantly learning and practice and then always implementing those things to be better and better and better and better over the years. So anyway, this is why I study with him. And for the practitioners who are listening to this, like I really highly recommend checking out his stuff. Um, the website is just functionalmethylation.com and then he'll be teaching in Sacramento this okay. coming weekend and then yeah. in Denver in June. Is that right? Um, yeah, I'm going to be, I will be in Iowa, Davin. Oh, Davenport. Davenport. Yeah. To yeah. my Palmer in Davenport. Oh no, no, Des Moines, Des Moines. Des Moines. Okay. Des Moines, sorry. Des Moines, Iowa. I'll be there in the spring. Awesome. And, and so, yeah, I kind of got some things coming up. So yeah, we have tons of stuff coming up. And then I also, you know, if you're, you're not quite ready to see a practitioner, but you just want like a little bit more knowledge about your physiology and how to work with stuff at home. That's when I'll kind of do like little group courses for people because sometimes it's nice to not do it all by yourself, which is why it's nice to work with a practitioner, but sometimes it's fun to have a group. So you guys can go to the link in my bio and click on that link and then you can learn more about that. Um, and then if you decide that you want to work with us, we had mentioned it earlier, but the website is just functionalhealthcolorado.com. Um, and yeah, we're always working on like we just want people to be healthy and happy in their lives that's why we got into this profession and why we love what we do because it's about reminding people of their vitality and like what health actually is health isn't really a destination it's kind of a journey and like understanding yourself on a deeper level and sometimes it's nice to have a friend to do that with so that's what we do <laughs> yeah that's great yeah anything any last words thoughts um not really. I think this was, this was really fun. I'm glad that we got to do this and uh, yeah. Totally. And I know I didn't get to all the questions. Um, sorry, there was a lot of things coming in. Um, w you know, we work together all the time, so this we can do this again. And so if you guys have other questions, just comment below the video on like what you want to know and then we'll customize what we're saying to what you want to know because this is why I do it live is because I want to help people where you need help. I can help in ways I think you need help, but I'd much rather you ask questions and I just answer your questions and then we talk about it that way. So write comment below, pass this on to your friends. Um, I hope it was helpful and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.